Well, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Tom Byrne, president of the uh, Korea Society. So welcome uh, this afternoon. And I, I see a lot of familiar faces, but for those of you who are here for the first time, uh, welcome to our new uh, attractive uh, office here on 350 Madison Avenue. So today we, we celebrate the second recipient of the Sherman Family Emerging Scholar Lecture Series, um, Mr. Dong Se Kim. Um, so thank you and uh, congratulations. <clears throat> and um, so we, we thank the Sherman family for the kind support for this new program we have, uh, trying to recognize and encourage new thought leaders on Korea in many different uh, disciplines. So um, congratulations again, Professor Kim. And Steve, do you want to take over? Thank you, Tom. And this is one of my favorite days uh, of the year here at the Korea Society uh, because of the generosity of the Shermans uh, in recognizing uh, an idea that they shared with uh, Kim Young-duk as well, our board member, uh, which was to grow a new generation of thought leadership on Korea here in the United States. And uh, Phil, having served uh, for City in Korea in the 1970s and having brought back a passion uh, for the energy and the people of the Korean Peninsula, I uh, thought this a good way forward. So we're very grateful, Phil and Brigitte, for your very, very kind uh, generosity and enthusiasm for this. And this is one of our newer initiatives uh, here at the Korea Society, our second year. And some of you were with us last year with our inaugural recipient, Dr. Katrin Katz, who has recently moved to the city and who has taught at Georgetown in the time between her appearance here and her, uh, her current endeavors. It's wonderful to have Dong Se Kim here today, especially this week, especially given this news cycle and what we have just seen in terms of this historic meeting between uh, South Korean President Moon Jae-in and North Korean leader Kim Jong-un, and the potential that it has. And some of those images, uh, is in particular, atop, atop Mount Pektu and the Lake of Heaven behind them. And Professor Dong Se Kim, who comes from a discipline of architecture and who is an urbanist and is an educator, has thought very, very creatively, as we will hear momentarily, on how we might look in new ways at the demilitarized zone. So I think his presentation here, not just for our intimate family here at the Korea Society today, but for those viewing online and those listening via podcast or viewing via view YouTube video, uh, is historic in terms of thinking of, of new ways. Uh, some of you in this room remember well the fall of the Berlin Wall and what that meant for the transformation of Europe. And I think some of what I know Professor Kim will be talking about today uh, will suggest a transformative process and a new way of looking of things that will be that historic in its fruition. I did want to thank, aside from the Shermans and Dong Se Kim and his wife, those who have actively supported this, we've reached out to 70 Korean study centers around the United States. And as a result, some of them are streaming live today. Some will be using this as part and parcel of their classes. But one thing they did do was deliver some truly, truly outstanding nominees. And the packages we received from universities like USC, Stanford University, George Washington University, among others, were truly outstanding. So we thank all those who applied and were truly impressed. But at the top of our list was Professor Dong Se Kim. As I've mentioned, an architect, an urbanist, an educator. He is based here in New York. He hails not only from Korea, but New Zealand, where he lived for 14 years. He is an assistant professor at the School of Architecture and Design at New York's Institute of Technology. He holds a Master in Design Studies with distinction from Harvard's Graduate School of Design. He earned his Master of Science in Architecture and Urban Design from Columbia University, with which we enjoy a very strong strategic relationship. He 
He has a professional Bachelor of Architecture with honors from Victoria University in Wellington, New Zealand. He was an assistant professor at Korea University and an adjunct assistant professor at Columbia University. Dong Se has successfully taught architecture, landscape, architecture and urban design studios and seminars at undergraduate and advanced levels internationally uh, at recognized institutions like Columbia, Carleton University in Ottawa, Korea University, of course, in Seoul, Kyungi University in Suwon, Monash University in Melbourne, RMIT University in Melbourne, and his alma mater, Victoria University in Wellington. His ongoing research examines how spatial practices construct plural understandings of the divided Korean peninsula. His investigation utilizes spatial ethnography to analyze various spaces across scales that shape and represent the Korean division and its potential integration and unification. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage Professor Dong Se Kim. Good afternoon. First of all, thank you very much for joining me. Um, I know you all have a very you know, busy schedule, and I'm very much um, looking forward to the discussion that follows my presentation. And I would like to uh, thank the Sherman family and the Co Korea Society uh, Senior Director Stephen Norper and Associate Policy Director Jonathan Corrado and Peter for making this happen. Thank you. So what a time to live in and present my work on the DMZ. I mean, everything's you know, happening at the moment and it's hard to catch up with really what's happening and these progresses or news that we might have thought of as impossible are happening. So I might even have to change the title of my talk, Imagining the Impossible, to even Executing the Possible. So within this milieu, I would like to share some of my ongoing research on the DMZ that starts to illustrate how spatial practices construct a plural understanding of the divided Korean peninsula which in turn allows us to question the fundamental binary nature of borders and concept of nation states, borders help to construct, contain, and maintain. These grand ideas and concepts might sound all too abstract, perhaps too ambitious too. Nonetheless, I want to start this talk from my personal uh, experience on, re on reflecting where I started my research on the DMZ, I could always trace back to a moment when I was living in New Zealand, where it is considered one of the most freest countries where you can do whatever you want, go to wherever you want, where I was confronted with the well-known separated families uh, issues in Korea. But also, I recently found out that my interest in the North Korean divide and its unification may be or may go back further, further back, longer than I might have uh, remembered. I was going through my old belongings as recently I moved into a new place. And I found this f uh, poster that I drew during my primary school years while in South uh, Seoul, Korea. At the top, the Korean text says, which means towards unification. Below this text, the image symbolizes the first unified Korean table tennis team that competed to win the women's team title under the unified Korean flag in the 1991 table tennis championship in Japan. The image below, below it illustrates the United football team that followed the table tennis team to compete in the 1991 FIFA World Youth Championship. I have to admit here that it's not the best illustration of a football here. At the bottom, 
The image obviously illustrates the two divided Koreas coming together. I also, it's a bit hard to uh, read here with my uh, bad handwriting here, but I also had a question written down behind the poster as a 10 year old. And it says, how long would it take for our country to unify after this unification of, the, of table tennis and football teams? These images represent the years built up during the South Korean president uh, Roh Tae-woo's North politic and thawing Cold War period, which led up to the 19, 1992 joint declaration of the denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. I made this poster some 27 years ago. Of course, now I have a very different understanding of what a Korean uni unification could and should be or shouldn't, shouldn't be compared to then. Many other important inter-Korean events also took place during the past three decades, but with all the dynamic push and pushbacks, it sometimes feel, it feels like we are back at the same place again, coming to a full circle. However, I believe this reminds us of the importance of continually making efforts to move forward despite the obstacles we may encounter. In this respect, my presentation and research is a lifelong journey towards answering this personal question. This talk explores how the discipline of architecture and landscape architecture, which I will refer to as spatial design, investigates the DMZ, the, a border zone that embodies the Korean conflict and the ongoing division. The DMZ bisects the Korean peninsula into two perpetually repelling binaries that act as a specter of the bloody Cold uh, War and the Korean War. Most often, borders and their borderlands are portrayed as lines and zones that produce exclusionary spaces. When these exclusionary character of a borderland dominates, borders are represented, represented as tensional spaces where conflicts between entities manifest themselves through violent confrontations. However, my research argues that the discipline of spatial design can radically reformulate and transform regressive exclusionary border conditions into inclusive spaces that become synergistic and productive for all involved parties. But at the core, the starting point could be as simple as an effort to imagining the current regressive exclusionary perception of the DMZ into a productive space just as we can see and perceive either a duck or a rabbit from this physically identical illustration. I will present three examples across scales, ranging from the larger scale mapping to the on the ground personal experience of how spatial design can act as a catalyst for this change. The first example illustrates how the dominant understanding of the DMZ as an impenetrable barrier can be deconstructed through large scale spatial design. The stereotypical representation of the DMZ as an impervious watertight border is deconstructed through a spatial temporal mapping as illustrated in this map. This map is an accumulation of multiple layers of information that is rotated 108 degrees. As a baseline, it starts to question the dominant north up orientation embedded in conventional cartography and the habitual thinking hidden in the inter-Korean relationships. This resulting map is constructed from four distinct con deconstructed layers of the DMZ. The first historical layer spatializes dynamically shifting border lines over time. It clearly illustrates how borders are constructed, maintained, and deconstructed over time. More importantly, it illustrates and demonstrates how we can shift the, its future trajectories. The second layer highlights elements and processes that reinforce the DMZ's performance and as an impenetrable border. For example, it accentuates the concentration of military forces and landmines 
that the two Koreans or Koreas are now um, trying to reduce over time. The third layer examines the ecological, political, and economic flows that proce and processes that occur over, over the border despite the DMZ performing as an effective barrier. For example, the crossing paths of the migrating birds above the ground and the rivers that cross across the DMZ are mapped out along with the economic transactions such as the Kaesong Industrial Complex and Gumgang uh, Mountain tourism zones that facilitate flows of capital. The last and fourth layer illustrates the clandestine global network that only registers at a regional and global scale. It traces how North Korean defectors leave North Korea through, a, uh, through the more permeable China-North Korean border because of the watertight DMZ. This last layer illustrates the importance of what a uh, border does at a larger scale and how it impacts its people and people who interact with it rather than what a border looks like. Again, the resulting spatialization, thus mapping here, destabilizes one's preconceived understanding of the DMZ and this constructs this border territory into a fertile ground for new ideas. For example, envisioning the current DMZ to be transformed into a new demos making zone, also a DMZ, where new kinds of experimental political citizenships that embrace global refugees and locally excluded others become possibilities because of these kinds of alternative spatial understanding of the DMZ. Ultimately, these alter alternative mapping projects start to uncover the internal and external forces that perpetuate the DMZ. This offers us an opportunity to radically rethink the fundamental nature of the DMZ and the changing notion of nation states. The second example operates at a medium scale at the landscape level. More specifically, it illustrates the spatial design's ability to envision alternative futures for the DMZ. Series of experimental research design studios that explore latent potentials of the DMZ pr uh, promote collective dialogues. For example, one of the landscape architecture studios I led at RMIT University in 2015, uh, titled, What if the DMZ became? With a question mark, the imagining the impossible explored various alternative scenarios for the DMZ. The research studio was essentially a critique of the uncriti uncritical approach to the then proposed World Peace Park in the DMZ. Students were asked to examine what would the DMZ become if it became in its entirety uh, uh, energy farm? What if the DMZ was an ecological field? What if the DMZ became a special economic zone? One of the students' uh, groups tackled this question directly by paraphrasing the work of the well-known video artist Peng Nam Jun's take on the DMZ. And you can see one of his uh, work at the back of this room as well. In 1988, Peng Nam Jun made this artwork for the Project DMZ exhibition that took place at the storefront for art and architecture in, here in New York. He wrote, DMZ must become a tiger farm. First, to attract Japanese tourists. Second, to keep ecology haven. Third, to eat up invaders. My students, Holly and Nirvana, on the right, went on to say the DMZ must become a biosphere zone. First, to have a tiger as a conduit for diplomacy. Second, to pacify technology. Third, to unite Korea. What makes this proposal compelling is how it appropriates existing military infrastructure and surveillance technologies, such as drones and existing guard posts and military personnel as infrastructure for the proposed biosphere. And here are some of the visual representations of that analysis. These are 
cross-sectional images of the DMZ being transformed into a UNESCO Biosphere Reserve. Here are tigers mingling with the Korean War relics and heritage buildings such as the old Labor Party building in Cheon at the bottom that brings back the currently ex uh, extinct Siberian tigers to the Korean Peninsula, which also fosters uh, cooperation between the two Koreas. The last example illustrates how spatial design can become a productive means to engage people directly. I was invited to participate in the Real DMZ project, which you see here, an ongoing annual research-based contemporary art project that examined the DMZ. In 2015, the Real DMZ project decided to engage Dong Song, a border town located uh, in Cheon, South Korea. I collaborated with an artist, Chung So Young, here in the photograph, to explore what the DMZ and the border meant to each of us as individuals and to us as an artist as, and as an architect. We wanted to explore how two similar yet different individuals and disciplines would work together just as the two separated careers would. We intensely debated what artists and architects would do to convey the characteristics of the DMZ as we understood it in this border town. After visiting and experiencing the small downtown for a couple of days, we concluded that the bus terminal was one of the most important portals for the border town. We decided to install two small paired follies one at the bus, uh, local bus terminal, one and, and the other at a nearby public space. The installation named Terminal Far and Near would meet the basic needs of its users in its uh, space and location and activates its surrounding spaces. As an architect, I address the bus terminal providing a space to sit and hang around while watching, uh, waiting for the bus. So Young addressed a front yard of a local cathedral not far from the bus terminal. Her installation provided visual interest and shade under the scorching summer sun. Both installations did not try to symbolically represent or directly visualize the DMZ. However, our dialectical working method tried to overcome the usual binary opposition embedded in the DMZ discourse by producing these two distinct forms that work together as a pair to exp express different intentions. The spatial outcome also allowed us to directly engage Dong Song's everyday people through multiple site visits, encounters with various stakeholders, and community during the design, installation, and deinstallation processes. This produced a particular lived experiences for us and its community in a border zone. I want to conclude with a current project that I'm working on right now. This uh, will be exhibited at the Milwaukee Art Museum next month. This briefcase that you see here contains raw ingredients that help spatial designers to engage stakeholders to collectively reimagine alternative futures for the DMZ. A replica of the D uh, Armistice Agreement Volume 1 text that you see um, here uh, in the image. And Armistice Agreement Volume 2 maps as spread out here Contained in the briefcase, describe and illustrate the locations of the military demarcation line, northern limit line, and the south, uh, southern limit line, informing how the DMZ originated from a line on a map. Additionally, 3D printed landmarks, such as the blue sheds of the Panmunjom's Joint Security Area and other landmarks within the DMZ, help spatial designers to facilitate and anticipate and direct future changes in the DMZ. After the exhibition, I plan to use the briefcase to engage a wide range of groups to further my research on the DMZ and its alternative futures. 
Today, I presented several ways in which spatial design engages the DMZ, especially understanding it as a fertile proving ground, one that is filled with critical investigations. In turn, these plur pluralistic approaches at various scales for the DMZ transforms it to be a place where collective knowledge and culture is produced where new experiences are materialized and a place where novel ways of living are experimented. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Kim. That was Thank you. captivating. And I think we all got uh, a new way to think about what, is, what has become a vexing problem. Uh, and this reframes it as a possibility. And here we see um, the essence of that idea in the picture behind me, which is the meeting of Kim Jong-un with President Moon Jae-in on top of Mount Baekdu. So I'll, I'll invite you now to start to think about some questions that you might have for Professor Kim. And as you get those brains stewing and think about what you might want to ask him, I'll take the moderator's prerogative and start with the first question, if I might. Um, you mentioned lots of different kinds of ideas for how we might reformulate the DMZ, mentioning things like an ecological preserve, uh, sports tourism, for a flow of capital and economic interactions. But I wonder which of these is most exciting to you, which is the one that really gives you hope and you think might be practical to implement, might be the most um, hopeful, might offer the most promising way for us to sort of use architecture and spatial design to transform the physical space and then transform our idea about what the relationship between the two Koreas is? Uh, in, in some way, I might be contradicting my, you know, discipline in a way um, where within architecture and urban design, you tend to look at things and design things and build things. And in, in, this, in this case, looking at the history and the time involved with the DMZ and how it's been for the last 60 odd years, there are many people who argue that it should remain as it is and untouched in some form. And until we do actually have that uh, agreement, I think we need to have an ongoing discussion but I believe that even if we wanted to keep it as a, let's say, a reserve or a space like Central Park, like here in Manhattan, where it's preserved, we need to actually activate it with different programs so that it becomes uh, an active space that has more value, that creates you know, culture, and so that it can become what it is in a true sense and remain as you know, DMZ and keep its identity. I believe, and I, I think it's something that I need to more look into, is the ecological aspect, which I haven't talked about so much today, which I believe is fundamental in understanding how we might be able to interact and utilize the DMZ. Well, I'll keep looking for hands. Uh, thank you, sir. We'll get a microphone to you in just one second. Have we had any estimates of how long it will take to clear the DMZ of landmines? Uh, that's a very good question. I guess it, you know, it's a question of how much are you willing to spend in terms of time and money. But you know, I think there are various calculations. Um, I think one of the most imp uh, difficult things related to landmines is you know, not knowing exactly where they are. Uh, there are very different numbers in terms of how many landmines are actually around and within the DMZ. I think some figures, you know, I've seen between 1 million to 2 million. And if you do a pure calculation, it is about one line landmine per square meter, which is, you know, a lot of landmines. So I think if the land needs, will be used in any way that needs to be, you know, addressed, and I believe you know, that process itself can become something that allows North and South Korea to work together, which I think is you know, starting to happen. 
Yeah, there are a number of examples of peace parks uh, around the world, and I know that's been proposed for the DMZ, which has unique ecological uh, aspects. But I was curious on the, the infrastructure. Are there groups, formal groups within the Korean governments uh, or universities that you know of that are actually working on this in, in a more practical than a pure conceptual sense? Mm, obviously, the Ministry of Unification has put out a lot of uh, reports. Um, I haven't seen a recent one. And I know that the current government is working on various things within the DMZ, which I'm not um, super familiar with, which I need to keep up. You know, everything is happening, you know, at this moment, you know, it's hard to keep up with the dynamic changes, which is a good thing for me and also a hard thing for me to, you know, uh, be informed. But as far as I know, I, I don't know any formal group that is exclusively looking at uh, the, the DMZ. But I know uh, a group of you know designers, architects who have been uh, looking at this area, uh, similar to my approach, but also in various different ways that are more concrete uh, proposals that relate to ecology and the peacemaking process. If I might follow up on that, um... You did this project many years ago, and it seems like many generations ago, given how much change that we've seen on the peninsula since you started working on this portfolio. I wonder if you could take us through from your perspective how the, the events of the last year, of the last two years, of the last week has changed or prompted you to rethink some of the design concepts that you've proposed. As I mentioned, I think I need to change my you know, title to uh executing the possible, you know? So, I mean, I think the, uh, there were various reasons I conducted this research. Uh, one was to actually test the uh, possibilities of how the discipline can envision different alternative futures through visual culture. And there was one student, uh, I think, uh, maybe in 2014, where the student proposed to somehow, I can't remember exactly the reason, but uh, burn down one of the blue buildings within the JSA and build it again, you know, and then burn it again and have some kind of meetings related to that event. But in his uh, visual sort of representation, when that event would happen or on around that event, he was proposing the meeting between the two leaders of North and South Korea. So he had this image of then uh, President Park Geun-hye, uh, you know, meeting uh, Kim Jong Un, which you know seems very weird in a way, you know. But you know, at a in 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 some sense, it has happened uh, in different ways with a different leader. Uh, so I think for me. The whole research is not about just doing things, but it's also understanding what a DMZ might mean to the Korean divide and the discipline that you know always builds and designs uh, containers that sometimes are very exclusion exclusionary, and how we can look at the DMZ and what it has done to learn from it to become much more practitioners of inclusion rather than you know uh, exclusion but reflecting back on the events that's happening I believe um, I think there are many positive things to read from what's happening now but I think there are also many challenges uh, related to what's happening at a larger political scale uh, which I have to I guess navigate as an individual as well um, thank you for your talk. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, it's a two-part question. So any good design actually has to incorporate the user. And as you know, the DMZ, is, it, the DMZ that you're talking about, of course, is the demilitarized zone where there's mine. Of course, there's no one there. But along the DMZ, there are, of course, inhabitants, people of their villages, and of course, farmers like Han Salim and so forth. They are agricultural cooperatives and so forth. So. I want to know, first of all, how much do you incorporate the users into your design? 
And the second part is then how do you negotiate all of these competing interests? What's the negotiating mechanism? Particularly if you have all these inhabitants, you have the designers, and then of course you have the government. And we all know during the Park Geun-hye regime, they, they uh, continuously try to reimagine the border in more of a commercial way. I don't see your imagination has much to deal with commerce. So how do you as a designer deal with the uh, negotiations of imagination? Yes, uh, thank you for your question. It's a very good question. And it's a question that I've been also asking myself and through my uh, studios that I've run with my students. Uh, at the end of the day, we are all designing for people and to understand the user's needs and where they're coming from, I believe is really important. We can, and in our uh, research and design studios, we always try to incorporate as much as we can from existing uh, data, such as uh, census data or GIS data, uh, understand the you know, community that we're working with. And sometimes we don't have enough time and resources to really have a meaningful connection, but we try to at least bring that up so that we know who we are actually trying to design for. So I guess that's one thing that we try to address. One of the students who also looked at the area one time, the uh, site that was given to them was near uh, Paju. And Paju uh, area was is you know well known for its uh, soybean um, growing. So the students actually addressed the existing industry or agriculture around that area and then incorporated that into their design that uh, was synthesized with the existing uh, tourism. So these kind of maybe uh, unfamiliar programs put together also created a very interesting space to uh, be put forward and by having these things made as images or physical models I believe helps people to come to the table literally and negotiate and put their ideas forward and I believe architecture and you know spatial design has a, a responsibility and potential to facilitate these in a better easier way because of the tactile nature of models that you can actually interact with and the images that you can actually you know look at and you know discuss even though the image that i might you know create and produce and show you might not be the perfect image you can have uh, someone react to it which then allows us to think about how we can modify it to become better and how we can facilitate those different competing ideas. I believe architecture and urban design, especially in the public sense, uh, in the public arena, I think needs to become an open uh, conduit that allows different ideas to talk to each other. And rather than trying to come up with uh, a consensus right away, I think it is better served as a medium to actually um, promote those kind of negotiations and tensions that could be facilitated through spatial design that might be physical or imaginary. So I think there's a lot of potential and um, I think there's a lot to be done, but uh, I'm not sure if it's, you know, it answers all your great questions, but I think that's how I kind of see it at the moment. Thank you. Hi. Uh, in the uh, Pyongyang Joint Declaration, one of the small clauses was the two sides agreed to hold a groundbreaking ceremony for the East Coast and West Coast rail and road connections. Um, I'm wondering what is there now that was left over from before the Korean War and how would you envision that that could be most favorably changed in line with this statement? Um, I'm not 
so familiar with those. I mean, I know those two areas in general, but I mean, I haven't been to that area and I haven't closely studied that area. But if you, if you look at the armistice map and the actual lines, the Northern Limit Line and the Southern Limit Line and the DMZ within it, those two lines and the MDL were drawn over the whole entire Korean, you know, cutting across the peninsula with minimal regards to what was there, except for some topographical sort of lines that they had to really follow in terms of rivers and uh, hills. And you can see that the map that they used um, were maps that contained existing, you know, villages and um, schools and infrastructure that was there, that was, you know, taken over by the DMZ. And the existing, the rails and roads that were connected were overlapped with existing infrastructure. So they were obviously connected to existing towns or buildings. And I would say that in any case, those existing buildings and towns, structures related to the main roads and rail infrastructure should be the ones that needs to be more closely studied so that they can be incorporated into however the you know connection might happen. a couple of hands so why don't we take two questions at a time now thank you very much I, i'm finding my imagination soaring with everything that you are saying um a couple of years ago maybe three or four years ago i was having a conversation with uh kang ik jung uh, a well-known korean uh, artist and uh, if i remember correctly he was saying that during the earlier the sunshine era, that there were much more, you know, broader imaginations that had resulted in the, at least the, the foundation or the early stages of developing a peace park, which was, uh, which would have included a sculpture park, not so much as a tourist destination, but, um, you know, jumping forward to an era when we would be able to more freely cross uh, and, and have inter exchanges between North Korean and South Korean people, that it would be um, a symbol of peace, but also a place where people could gather and enjoy nature and art. And that several of his structures, or uh, I would think they might have been um, sculptures and of others, had been placed. Um, are you familiar with this project? And would you be able to tell us where it stands today? OK, thank you. And we'll take one more question. I believe I saw a hand back, back over that way. We'll take that question as well. Uh, well, there are many great ideas here, but uh, where are you going to put the Trump Hotel and Casino and the uh, Trump uh, Country Club and Golf Course and maybe the Trump Tower, Korea, and who knows what else? <laughs> okay, great. Thank you for the most important, interesting question. Um, I don't know if he would agree, but I, I just, I mean, I know he likes towers and you know the tower goes with the brand trump trump tower but there are if you know things go uh well there are existing um infiltration tunnels uh in the dmz which could be an interesting place for him to look at to develop his uh <laughs> development and um i mean it could be dark inside there but it could be lit and with um, the colors that he likes. So, I mean, that could be, you know, a tourist attraction and something that could be, you know, looked at. Going back to Kang Ik Chung's uh, work, I know of some of his work related to the DMZ, but I'm not so familiar with the ones that you are referring to that has been already uh, installed, as you mentioned. And I, I think I should really look into that and perhaps um, uh, study that more.
at the risk of slightly uh, heresy here, um, since the DMZ is what's divided Korea, in a unified Korea, should not the DMZ more or less disappear? I think yes. If you know the unification does happen in whatever form or manner, I guess it would uh, should disappear in the way that it functions. But the actual physicality, the physical space, might remain, and. Um, may be transformed into something that is very productive. And I think there is a lot of great opportunities for it to be looked at and to be used in a much more productive sense in producing real culture and real you know, um, way of understanding the division rather than being uh, used as just com commercial use. Um, Yep, we have two in the back there. So let's let's take these two, please. Um, how did you come to collaborate with the designer? And can you tell us more about her background? So, in, yeah, OK, I'll take the other question. Yeah, uh, for the unification for North and South Korea, a lot of people compare it to East and West Germany unification. So for DMZ uh, case study, have you looked at East Germany, West Germany along the wall, all the developments, uh, how it came to be? OK, so the first question related to the artist. Uh, I was in Korea in 2015 teaching at Korea University and doing some field research. Uh, and while I was there, I was connected with the, the real DMZ project, which is still going on and has been going on for the last couple of years. And they usually have uh, a site visit to the areas that they will be working with. And you can sign up to go to the site with the artist. And on that trip, I actually met her. And we started talking about her previous work and how, how her uh, work related to the DMZ but was new to the topic. So we had a great conversation about how artists might approach the DMZ, which might be similar or different to architects. And um, we wanted to you know, do something together, as I mentioned to look at the similarities and differences between the disciplines and how that might correlate with the relationship that the two Koreas have. Um, so all of the artists who were invited to actually participate, I believe majority of them, um, I mean, we were invited as individuals and they produced their work as individuals. But for us, it was very important for us to collaborate and have something uh, produced together because the whole conversation started with the site visit. And it also allowed us to really uh, think about the DMZ from different perspectives that allowed me to also open up to different uh, possibilities. No, the invitation was from the curators who put this a real DMZ project together. Uh, it was organized by Art uh, Sanje, based in Seoul. And they have been conducting the real uh, DMZ project since 2012. And they've been doing it every year. So it was a, an art uh, institution that invited me to participate in that uh, project. Uh, Going to the unification of Germany that is, you know, raised and is talked about a lot in the context of how might North and South Korea come together and unify. And I think there's a, a great deal of things to, you know, learn from the whole process. But I also believe that it's a very different context in terms of the time period and also the geopolitical context. But if you only look at the very pure nature of the border and its physical form, the border that existed uh, between Germany, the two Germanys, 
uh, especially in Berlin, was an urban one, which is very different to the one that we see in the Korean Peninsula. And because of the border that exists in the Korean Peninsula at the DMZ, it's become very, very um, rural and much more peripheral than it was. And because of that density of uh, the difference between the density that existed in Germany, which is more urban, with, involved with urbanity, I believe the actual physical intimate experience of those two uh, different uh, border conditions, I believe, are you know very uh, different. So it, it's hard to kind of equate what happened physically in Germany to what might happen in Korea. Um, but at a fundamental sense, I think those you know borders all exist at a particular period and through various reasons they you know are deconstructed and i think there are uh, things that we can actually learn from germany as well since north and south korea have such different architectural styles right do you think that a cooperative architectural project should integrate different parts maybe a fusion of North and South Korean architecture, should it look back to a period where of common history and heritage to reflect that? Or should it do neither of those two and instead look toward a shared future? That's a great question. I, I think there is some answer to your question in, in the exhibition that I, I was involved in in 2014 in Venice, where there was architectural um, Biennale. Uh, and in the Korean pavilion, there was an exhibition called The Crow's Eye View, the Korean Peninsula, where the architecture and urban design of North and South Korea came together through the exhibition. Uh, what was striking for me was how similar, in some sense, some of the buildings that were representing the power and state uh, between North and South Korea. Even though they had very different ideologies, the way in which they tried to project power through those buildings were strikingly similar. And how they interacted with traditional elements of Korean architecture was very similar as well. So I think the exhibition illustrated more the commonalities rather than the differences that we see and are sometimes accentuated in the news that we read between North and South Korea. And I believe there are much more to be shared than to you know, think about the differences between the two countries. Any further questions? If not, I'll invite Dr. Stephen Norper to give the concluding remarks. Thank you. Uh and really, uh, a round of applause for Professor Dong Sen Kim. We'd like to present him with the Sherman Prize uh, for this outstanding lecture and your creative grasp. And we encourage you to continue as you go forward as a thought leader on Korean affairs in the United States. So we're just so honored. Thank you. We have a few additional things for you. Uh, one installed last night was a wonderful exhibition, and you're the first to see it, uh, by Kwang Young Chun called Aggregations. And it deals with different spatial realities as well. So it's a nice artistic complement to what we've just heard. And so we invite you to stay and to enjoy it. The official opening is not until September 26. So you're the very first to see this. And parts of it will go on to the Brooklyn Museum for a major exhibition, so this is an exciting sneak preview. Uh, but it gives us an artistic overlay, which going back to the foundation of the Korea Society 61 years ago by General James Van Fleet, just a block from here on the other side of Grand Central, uh, was meant to be a meeting place uh, for creative thought on policy, current affairs, and the arts. And so to that end, uh, it's a nice aesthetic addition to today. Uh, we also wanted to uh, honor Dong Se's uh, 
heritage through including New Zealand wines in our reception today. So we have New Zealand uh, reds and some delicious uh, Sauvignon Blancs. We would encourage you to please stay, enjoy those. We have it set up in the gallery now, I'm sorry, in the galley, the kitchen, and we would encourage you to just follow through and then congregate in the gallery here and enjoy the artwork and the, uh, the nice uh, offerings that we have both by way of food and wine. Uh, again, we would like to thank those who are streaming online as well as uh, those who are listening via podcast or viewing via YouTube video. And we would like to thank very much our board member, Y.D. Kim, uh, who was one of the initial people who conceived of something to grow a new generation of thought leaders on Korea who has served our board as the senior most member and who was born in North Korea and is just an amazing individual to talk about. Uh, he uh, has spent serious, he spent serious time with Chung Ju Young and uh, is a maverick in his own right. So uh, Dr. Kim, thank you for honoring us with your presence. And to the Shermans, to Phil and Brigitte, thank you for this. Uh, we have striven to, uh, to reach out, uh, to reach wide, uh, and we know that is your vision. And we really appreciate not only your legacy and commitment to the peninsula, but what you do here for the Korea Society. And Phil is a member of our board now as well. Thank you all for taking the time to join us here today, and we look forward to continuing for the next hour, as long as you can stay with us in conversation uh, and have a chance to please meet our recipient, Professor Dong Se Kim. Thank you all.